All right. Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Newman. I study coronaviruses for a living. Um, yeah, and I have done even since before this uh, terrible pandemic. So I'm here to answer your questions based on papers that I've read. That's that's my job. That's my function. Yeah, let's go. Next question is from Mary. Ah, hello again, Mary. Yeah, okay. Hi again from Bryan, Texas. Yeah, the Bryan College Station area. Yeah. CSTAT, apparently, yeah, <laughs> or the BCS, they said on a radio station. Um, thank you all for all the work and giving us uh, straightforward answers. I try, thanks. Um, I'm sure that you miss your family tremendously when you are in Bryan College Station. I do. I go back every weekend, or I was going back every weekend. Uh, here, I've been in Texarkana for an entire week now, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was weirdly relaxing, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see. I think I've seen answers to these already, but not sure. And the answers change, so it's okay. Just, just ask. Yeah. Uh, so provide the links. A friend uh, asked me, and she calls Dr. Ben my friend, uh, even though we have never met, because I've asked some questions on her behalf. That's fine. Whatever. Why not? Why, why can't we be friends? All right. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and because her daughter tested positive. So how long is she immune or is she immune? Yeah, the answer is nobody knows, but here's the new data, yeah. Um, and also, will this strain of coronavirus be here forever like the flu? That's a thing that this coronavirus does not have to be around forever, and we can definitely do something about that, but it takes a lot of work. And right now, some countries are doing the work, other countries are not, and so the whole world is a mess. You kind of need all the countries, or at least all the big ones, to get together and get their heads in the game and, you know, yeah, <laughs> play to win for a change, instead of play to lose gracefully, which is what we're doing. We're uh, marching down the field and kicking that field goal every single time, and we miss a couple, but yeah, it feels like progress, even though we're behind, you know, um, I don't know, 50 to 9. <laughs> There you go, that football metaphor. I don't know if that works, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. So, how long is she immune or is she immune? Well, you're asking this on the day when we have the first confirmed report of a <coughs> pardon person uh, from Hong Kong who has tested positive twice for coronavirus, and they're sure it's a different virus. The reason, so I mentioned this, I think, in an earlier post from today, but let's let's go into the details. So if you want to read this, it is not yet out um, at the journal where it's going to be published. It will probably come out over the next day or two, but you can go on the Twitter right now. Oh my gosh, a good use for Twitter? Maybe, I don't know. Um, and so you are going to want to Google um, Lillian Cheng, who is at CWY. L-I-L-I-A-M. Yeah. And uh, she's from the South China Morning Post or Morning News, something like that. Anyway, I've, I've talked with uh, some other uh, reporters from this site, and man, are they on it. Yeah, they are, they are all over every new advance um, in a way, like real time, that I struggle to keep up with. Yeah, so good for them. Yeah. And they seem to know what they're doing for the most part. She has got screen caps from the entire paper, posted four little Twitter pictures, whatever whatever those are, at a time. And you can actually read through the entire thing. Um, it's a case report. It's a person who was infected uh, in March, um, discharged in April, and they had a genome sequence. And the weird thing about the first time this person was infected is that the virus had a deletion. So it had a bunch of mutations, and it also had a deletion in this thing called um, uh, SARS-8 or Open Reading Frame 8. It's way down toward the tail end of the virus, right before the nucleoprotein gene. If, if <laughs> like that, like that makes any yeah <laughs> connection to anybody. But it is, it is actually there. Um, and this is a gene that seems to make the virus a little bit more severe when it's there, and when it gets knocked out, it seems to make the virus a little bit easier to manage for reasons we do not fully understand. Uh, it's probably doing something to our interferon system because everything about this virus seems to be doing something to our interferon system. Anyway, this person, um, the first virus they had had a deletion in it, and then this person came down with it again, was diagnosed on August 15th, and they sequenced the virus and lo and behold, it's 
not a relative of the old virus, and that deletion is repaired because it didn't magic itself out of nowhere. This is legitimately a person who has caught the virus twice. This is kind of where the bar is. You'd have to have a genome sequence from the first time and the second time, and the genome sequences would have to be different in a way that there's no way that they could have, uh, you know, one could have turned into the other. And as luck would have it, this this is it. So there have been other people who probably or maybe have been infected twice. And there are certainly a lot of people saying they've been infected twice, and they're probably not all wrong. It's just that scientifically it is very difficult. You have to have a super weirdo case like this one to uh, be able to say for sure about that. Anyway, that's not your actual question. Your actual question is, how long is your friend's daughter going to be safe? And the answer is, we don't know. Um, there are things you could do to try and figure it out. So if, um, if the daughter were to get an antibody ELISA test, um, and you gotta like talk your employer or insurance company or whatever into this, and I don't know, they may say no, yeah. But um, if there's a really high amount of antibody, then it, all you can say is that at least the chances are that for now, she's probably okay. If you have antibody levels, like total antibody levels that are, let's say, 10,000 or above. Um, or if you can get a neutralizing antibody test, which again, there's no way unless you happen to run a molecular biology lab that does neutralization tests, in which case, what are you writing to me for? Yeah, <laughs> you know all this stuff. Um, but uh, that, that would be a thing. I guess what you could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a uh, group uh, led by, I believe it's James Musser, down at Houston Memorial, Houston Baptist, Houston, Houston Methodist, Houston Methodist Hospital. There we go. And they do convalescent plasma therapy. And so one thing that they will do is take a person's plasma, read it out. They'll presumably give you the information like how much antibody was in there, do the neutralization test, and they're doing this in order to give convalescent plasma theory uh, therapy, like um, you know, antibodies from one person to another person, um, to protect against disease. Um, and there are a couple papers showing this works at least to some extent. So yeah, it does not protect everybody. Oh my gosh, no! It's like a five percent death rate decrease in certain populations. You know, terms and conditions apply. <laughs> All that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> at best in studies that are not proper placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials like you're supposed to do. So once again, these effects may go away when we have a real large study out there. And that's, if that happens, that's gonna be really sad, but it's gonna be a thing that we have to get over and we, we can't like, you know, grab onto this forever. But it's a thing that at the present may work. So, yeah. Um, but if um, if she was accepted into that and uh, was willing to donate uh, plasma, you could probably, you know, uh, kind of guerrilla style, end up with a um, total antibody count and neutralization count. And you want to look for, um, let's see, they're not using it unless the neutralization titer is over 150. And you would want to see a neutralization titer up in like the thousands. That would be good. That's the you're probably protected for a while level. And these are all based on what people tend to have right after they've got over it. Because right after you get over it, you have enough immunity that you've actually cleared it out of your system. So it was enough to do the job, whatever, you know, whatever the job was, all the different parts of the job. And so that's what we're basing it on. Um, but yeah, outside of that, and for like any other regular normal person, there's no good way to tell. There is no way to tell whether you can get it again, and now we know that definitely you can get it again. It has been scientifically proven, so we can relax about that. Um, yeah. And so it just basically means that everybody everywhere needs to be on their toes, and yeah, uh, why there are still places and people that are not on board with getting rid of this thing once and for all is very frustrating and very hard to understand from a scientific perspective. It's just uh, bonkers. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> but there we go. All right. Uh, so that's eh, kind of a rambling answer. Um, and will it be here forever like flu? We don't know. We can get rid of it. But um, it, it depends what we do. 
This is like a choose your own adventure and we've got a choice and right now we're choosing coronavirus forever. I don't think that is a good choice. That is not a choice that we can live with. It's just the easiest choice right now. Or it seems like the easiest short-term choice and is 100% disastrous long-term from the way it looks to a virologist. So there you go. <laughs> um, thanks very much. This has been Ask Dr. Ben.